Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for today's talk. And our prayer is today that this talk will encourage you and that God will speak to you through it. And I do wanna say, you gotta to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now if you wanna see more stuff like this, all the latest content coming out. And also, don't forget, check out our website, myhopecity.cc and connect with us on Facebook by liking our page, Hope City Epton, and joining our Facebook groups. Again, thank you so much for joining us and I can't wait to see how God is gonna to speak to you through this talk. What's up, Hope City? My name is Shane. I am the youth pastor here, and I'm excited that I get the opportunity to bring the word this morning and share what I believe that God has put on my heart. If you're a part of Hope City here and you're a part of the life of Hope City, I want to encourage you, go back and listen to the past couple weeks of messages because we just got out of the Legacy series, and the Legacy series is such a timely message and something that is so ingrained in the DNA of our church. So again, go back and check that out. And if you're watching right here online too, let me tell you, we're having in-person gatherings. This is amazing. I love being able to come to in-person church. So if you're in the area and you're able to come out, I would encourage you, come on out, check out in-person church. You may be even able to check out the next service if you're watching this at 9.30. I'm excited for what God is going to speak today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you for who you are, God. I thank you for what you're doing. God, I pray that you speak in and through me today, God. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, we're going into a brand new series today called The Abundant Life. Myself and a couple others throughout the couple, next couple of weeks, we're going to be tackling what it looks like to live an abundant life with Jesus, how God calls us to live an abundant life, how God wants us to live an abundant life. And it's all going to be along John 10.10, 10, which says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And other translations would say abundant life that through Jesus, we can experience thing called abundant life. So what does that look like? And what are different ways to lean into that? That's a little bit of what we're gonna get in today. I like to get a little bit funky with my title messages. And we are talking along the lines of something that I like to call, would you make a whip? If you're right here and you're watching and you have an opportunity to write in the chat, feel free to write, would you make a whip? And we're gonna explore how making a whip could ultimately bring us into that abundant life that Jesus has for us. Before we get rolling, I wanna ask you a question and I wanna share with you a little story in my life along this, but have you ever found yourself in a situation where things didn't turn out fully how you expect it? There's some wild and crazy things that happen in life. And I think of one story in particular, when I was around 10 to 12 years old and my family decided to go on vacation to Toronto. Now my family, they vacation a little bit differently than other families because my dad instilled this thing in me and my dad does this thing himself where he likes to get the best deal. I know there's some people out there that might agree with the same thing, getting the best deal. There's something good that happens when you get the best deal. It feels great. So that actually led us to vacation a little bit differently and we ended up, when we went to Toronto this time, we didn't stay in Toronto. We didn't stay right next to the CN Tower. We actually stayed 40 minutes to an hour outside of Toronto in this hotel where we could get the absolute best deal. And this actually led to a little bit of a crazy story because this allowed us to get a taxi that brought us into Toronto. And this is where we met a man who kind of stirred the pot a little bit. So we ended up getting this taxi driver and I remember he pulled up to the hotel and as he got out of the car, this man was big. And I don't mean like overweight big, I mean like he was just like massive, like shoulders broad, big arms. He was a big dude and he was probably around 45 years old and he looked like he was from somewhere, probably like Eastern Europe, like Slovakia, Ukraine, I don't know, somewhere like there, but Toronto wasn't his hometown. So this guy gets out of the car and he, I see the stature and everything like that. So we get in the car, my family, and we go into Toronto and everything's normal at first. We go throughout our day and this guy picks us up at the end of the day. And as he picks us up, this guy looks at us and he says, let's go to the airport. He's like, I want to take you to see the planes. And it's like nine o'clock at night and my family and sister are like, no, no, like we're good. We don't need to see the planes. And he's like, no, like it's so cool. Like you want to see the big planes coming, like the Toronto Pearson airport, come on. So eventually he talks us into it. So we go, we go to the airport, but he doesn't actually bring us to the airport. And this is where things take a little bit of a crazy turn. He brings us to this side dirt road around the airport that is com completely pitch black. So we're in this car with this stranger, with this man who we don't know, and he's brought us to watch these planes on this dark dirt road. 
And I know I'm starting to feel a little bit weird about it. My dad's starting to feel a little bit weird about it. My mom's starting to feel a little bit weird. My brother, Corey, he doesn't think anything. He's just fascinated by the planes. But as we pulled up on this dirt road, he insists that we get out of the car. And at this point, like, I think there's a couple things going through my mind and my brother's minds, maybe. But also my mom and my dad, where we're thinking, what's this guy going to do? It's like, are we getting kidnapped here? What's going on? And then off in the distance, this big group of motorbikes comes flying around the corner, completely pitch dark. And we thought, all right. Right. This guy brought back up. He's kidnapping us. Something's happening. It's like we're completely weirded out. But then the motorbikes just come. They go by. They drive away. The guy says, get back in the car. And he brings us back to the hotel. We completely thought things were going to take an absolute turn for the worse. All the signs pointed that way. And nothing happened. And I look back and I see it as a crazy story. And I don't really know exactly what the guy was doing in that moment. But it's something that's so ingrained in my memory. And there's something about crazy stories that just get ingrained in your memory. And the thing that I love about the Word of God, the Bible, is there are so many crazy stories in the Bible. And by crazy, I think I mean awesome. I love the turn that Scripture takes and how God pulls some things out. And I want to look at a specific story from the life of Jesus today. And we're going to talk about would you make a whip? And we're going to break down what that means and how you can walk into the abundant life with that. If you have a Bible today, I encourage you to open it up to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. You can also find the story in the four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well. But today in John, we're going to pull something out that the other ones don't necessarily focus on. So you can read it along with me if you got your Bible. And it says this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple cords, both sheep and cattle. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. If you've read the Bible before, if you've studied the life of Jesus, you might know this story stands out in a little bit of a different way than the others. Some people even look at this story and they say, well, why did Jesus overreact like that? They're like, that's not in the character of Jesus. But there's something I want to draw out and point out to you that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing in this moment and he purposely did it. And I want to look again at verse 15. I'll read it. So he made a whip out of cords and drove from all the temple cords, both sheep and cattle, and he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. It says he made a whip out of cords. In this moment, Jesus made a whip. And someone pointed this out to me recently, and it just stuck with me, the fact Jesus made a whip. Jesus didn't walk into this temple and think, well, what's going on? Like, didn't grab a whip randomly and just start driving people out of the temple. Jesus walked in. He saw what was going on in this temple, and he took the time to make a whip out of cords. And I'm sure his disciples looked at him, and they said, what is he doing? Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you taking the time to do this? Like, what's the point? And Jesus would have just sat there, and I kind of picture Jesus calm and nonchalant, making the whip, being like, guys, like, I know what I'm doing. Guys, there's a thing I'm trying to illustrate here. Guys, there's something happening in this temple that shouldn't happen. So here's the question that I want to explore. Would you make a whip? Why did Jesus make a whip in this moment? And once we see why did Jesus make a whip in this moment, should we be making whips in our life? And no, I don't mean a physical whip, but we're going to draw something here of showing what Jesus was really looking at. So if you look, why did Jesus make a whip? If you look at this in the gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 17, same story, just a different perspective. It says this, as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Objectively, people were taking a house of prayer God's temple, and they were making it into a den of robbers. It says, a house of prayer, a desire, and a manifestation for the presence of God. But instead, people were letting fleshly desires in. In this moment, Jesus made a whip because he was passionate about the house of God being a place where the power of God dwelled and true worship happened. And you might ask yourself, where are you going with this? Like, are you saying that we should be going in the churches around Fredericton or wherever you're from and start flipping tables if we see people selling stuff or start driving out cattle with a whip if you see livestock in the church? That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that Jesus looked at the house of God and saw that it was supposed to be a place where true worship and prayer and holiness dwelt, and it wasn't. And that's what he was trying to illustrate. So what does this have to do with us? Back before Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross to bring us into relationship with Jesus and get rid of our sin, 
there was a time where the temple was a place where God's presence just dwelt. That we have the Holy Spirit now that dwells among us as Christians. So back in this time, there's a place in the temple and they called it the holiest of holies. And in this place in the temple, there, temple, there was this large curtain. And this curtain, if you go back in the Bible, you can see how it describes it. But there was just like a curtain like no other. Like this thing wasn't ripping or tearing. And this thing was supposed to separate the other parts of the temple from the holiest of holies, the place where God's presence dwelt. And when Jesus went and died on the cross for our sins, when he died, it says that curtain was ripped. And a place that only certain people were allowed to access at certain times in doing certain things, that curtain ripped. And God used that to symbolize that his presence was for everyone, that as followers of Jesus, we have access to his Holy Spirit. We have access to his presence. So in this place, Jesus drove out these people from this temple because they were basically defiling the holy presence of God, that there was an appearance of holiness. The temple looked holy, but inside there was something different going on. And today you are the church. We are the church that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And we are the church. We are the temple. 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, says this, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my pe people. You are the temple of God. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. God chooses us to be his dwelling place for his power and his presence. Through the Holy Spirit, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be holy. In the same way that Jesus responded for the things going on in the temple that weren't holy, Jesus looks at us now and he looks at things in our life that don't reflect holiness and he says, would you make a whip and get rid of that already? Would you make a whip? If there was things in your life that shouldn't be there, would you make a whip? And if you're just looking for a definition of make a whip to just really make it clear, it's this. Immediate and possibly extreme action to not just appear holy by outward appearance, but be holy by inward desires and actions. Jesus made a whip because there was something that appeared holy, the temple. It appeared holy, but upon closer look, it wasn't what it appeared. By making a whip, you have an opportunity to experience more of the abundant life that we have outlined here in John 10.10 10, that Jesus spoke of. So what does that look like for you today? What does it look like for you to make a whip? What does it look like to have things in your life that maybe you're a pure holy, but inwardly there's some things manifest in your life that shouldn't be there? There's a couple different reasons why I believe that Jesus would have made a whip in today's culture, and we're going to explore a couple of them. The first one I want to say is whip your passion. If you're watching right now and you can write in the chat, write whip your passion. Do you know what the purpose of a whip is in terms of horse racing? The purpose of a whip is to make horses run faster and maintain speed when running towards the end of a race. The whip pushes the horse. As a follower of Jesus, I believe that God calls you to push yourself by constant discipline, that God calls us to do certain things in our life that reflect the presence of God, that invite the presence of God by discipline. This right here that I have in my hand is a holy word of God. This word is infallible. There is no error in it. That yes, written by man, but it is inspired by God. That God placed it on the hearts of men and women all throughout history. People that he filled with his spirit to write this word so that we as Christians can mold and shape our lives around it. So we as Christians can look at this and read about the life of Jesus and look how to model Jesus. The word of God is of the utmost importance and the word of God is crucial for every believer. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. This is the word of God. This is meant to be fuel for our soul, a light to our path, as it says in Psalm 119.105. Yet, so few of us as 21st century people read it. So few of us as 21st century people read it. I found a little bit of a survey, and yes, it's an American survey, but I feel like it's pretty close to what Canadians would be reflecting as well in their life. But this survey is on frequency of Bible reading throughout the year. So this is on all American citizens. In 2019, they did a poll, and it says right here that 14% of the people polled said they read their Bible every day. It says another 14% of the people they polled several times a week. It says 8% of people said once a week, 7% once a month, 6% three or four times a year, 
7% once or twice a year, 10% less than once a year, and 35% said never. And you might ask yourself, you're like, okay, like that's, that's on all Americans though. It's like not everyone in America is a Christian. So it's like, what does that really tell us? Well, if you do a quick Google search, you would find that 69% of people in America say that they are Christians. That means 69% of people profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And by doing that, you are saying that I adhere to the Bible, the Holy Scripture. This is a thing that us Christians do. We read this thing because this book brings life. So if you take that number and you compare that 69% of people say that they're Christians and you do some math and you even things out and you assume that the 35% of people that don't read their Bible at all, at all are the people that aren't Christians, you would soon come to the conclusion of this. And this is such, it's such a weighty statistic, but it says, if you add these numbers and compare them and do the math, you would find that 50%, 56% of Christians read their Bible once a week or less. 56% of Christians read their Bible once a week or less. This is the holy word of God that we're supposed to build our life upon. But if you look at the math, if you look at the statistics and no, I don't know how accurate they are. Yes, I did the math. And ultimately I do believe that there is some sort of accuracy with it. But 56% of Christians don't read their Bible more than once a week. It's the holy word of God. And I'm not saying that from like a shaming standpoint, but I'm saying that if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you need to read this thing. Because the thing about the word of God is it's hard to be passionate about a life outlined in scripture if you're not willing to dive in and hear the voice of God for yourself. If you're looking for direction and guidance from God in your life, he's calling you to read his scripture for that thing. So I say whip your passion. So what do I mean by that? I find that sometimes Christians can get stuck in a rut where they feel like they're losing their passion for God. Where for whatever reason in their life that they feel like they're just not as passionate, that there was one time in their life where maybe they felt it more, but for whatever reason now they don't feel super passionate. And yes, I understand life happens, that different situations come their way. But if someone were to ever say to me that I feel like I'm losing my passion for Jesus, or I feel like I'm losing my passion for following God, the first thing I would ask them is this, where is the word of God in your life? Where is the word of God in your life? Where is prayer in your life? Where is your relationship with Jesus? And I know this is like fundamentals 101, but when I read that statistic, it just blew me away. 56% of people read their Bible less than once a week, once a week or less. This is the holy word of God. If you find yourself losing passion for God, I'd ask you, where is Bible reading in your day? Where is prayer in your day? If you look in John 2, 17, just the end part of that scripture that we're focusing on today, it says his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. This was Jesus after he saw an appearance of holiness, but when he looked in a deeper reflection, he saw that there really wasn't a lot of holiness going on. It says zeal consumed him. Do you know what zeal is? Zeal is great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or objective. Jesus looked around at the temple, saw a lack of holiness. Zeal for holiness consumed him. Great enthusiasm for holiness consumed him. And he was looking for pursuit, honor, and worship of the living God. And that's the same thing that he looks in us as followers of Jesus. He looks for pursuit, honor, and worship towards the living God. 1 Peter 2, 9 says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is the standard. So I ask you today, what are you doing to meet that standard? God has so much for us outlined in scripture. God has so much for us outlined in this book. And I say read this book, not because this is what this book says to do only, but because it is the word of God and the word of God sharpens us. The word of God brings us purpose. The word of God brings us life. And ultimately the word of God outlines how to, we can best dive in and live a relationship with him, how we can experience abundant life. So if you sit there and you find that these things are in your day and you find yourself losing passion, I would say to whip your passion means to continue small. To whip your passion means to continue small. And I don't mean small as an insignificant. I mean small as in something that might not take up a lot of time to do. I'm a big believer that by doing small acts of something every single day, it will ultimately prepare you for the big decisions in your life. So if you make a small decision that every single day you read your Bible, every single day you get in God's presence for yourself, not just on Sunday, every single day that ultimately when those big decisions come up in your life where things are pushing at you, where 
indescribable situations come your way and you're sitting there and be like, am I gonna make a decision that honors God? Am I gonna follow God? Or am I gonna let things push me away? That ultimately, if you're making the small decision to follow Jesus every day, I would argue when you go to make that big decision, it's gonna be easy because you've been seeking his word and seeking his face every day. If you wanna experience abundant life that he has outlined, read scripture, dive into it for yourself. God's got so much here for you. The second thing that I believe that if Jesus was walking this earth during this day that he would make a whip for is this, whip your moment, whip your moment. I kind of have this issue where sometimes my mind just goes a million miles a minute. And sometimes it's not so bad because it can allow me to focus or get stuff done real quick. But other times it brings me where it kind of takes me out of a moment. For example, sometimes when I go to sleep at night, I find my thoughts just going to all the things I do. I remember back, I was in university for a year for engineering, and when I couldn't solve a math problem, I would find myself falling asleep at night, and I would just naturally start thinking about it without even trying. And sometimes I would even come up with like how to solve it, and I would write it down on my phone real quick. Now I find myself when I go to sleep, I find messages or things that I'm going to share with the youth or different ministry things that I'd like to do. I find those things resting on my mind as I'm going to sleep at night. I would say that one eighth of this message was probably written as I was going to sleep at night. And I know maybe that sounds kind of cool and in a certain context, it's really good. But there's other times where it actually causes me a problem where I find myself physically in a moment, but mentally, spiritually, whatever you want to say there, anything but physically, I'm not there. I found myself a couple of weeks ago, we went to Caden's Island for a Holy Spirit weekend with some of our youth. And it was a phenomenal weekend. It was Holy Spirit Alpha weekend. We had about 60 students that came, came out for something called Holy Spirit weekend. That's awesome. And I was so excited for it. I planned, prepared, and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And I knew that God was going to show up. And as we got there, as the students came, as we were worshiping in a room with about 60 students plus our leaders, and we were worshiping God, I found myself in that moment, and my mind just kept going. And I find myself in that moment asking the question, do you think people are engaged? Do you think people are having fun? How do you think this going? How do you think this person is doing this thing? How do you think the music is going? Should we do three songs instead of two? And I found myself asking all these questions in this moment. And it took me out of the moment that I was sitting there worshiping with 60 students. I love being with youth. I love pursuing Jesus with youth. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I found myself in that moment, taken out of that moment, not for any good reason, except the fact that I was physically there, but mentally I was somewhere else. And I found myself in that moment, checking myself, because I felt God's still small voice speak to me saying, Shane, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And if you trust me, then just chill. I'm paraphrasing God a little bit. God didn't actually say chill to me. But that's what I got from it. Just chill out. All these things are going on. You're in this amazing moment where you can worship God, but for some reason your mind is focused on something else elsewhere. Do you trust me? And if you trust me, just chill. And that's why I say whip your moment because I feel like today in culture, we can find ourselves in these moments without actually being there. I find that we're in like an overwhelming consuming culture where one of the biggest issues is that we're just go, 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 go. And there's nothing wrong with doing things. There's nothing wrong with getting things done. But there is something a little bit wrong when you're constantly in moments, but you find yourself mentally elsewhere. And it's especially dangerous when you do that with God. And let me explain. I don't just want you to be a part of what God is doing. I want you to be, I don't want you to just watch what God is doing. I want you to be a part of what God is doing. Don't just watch what God is doing. Be a part of what God is doing. That if you want to whip your moment, you need to keep that in mind. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. John 2, 14 to 15, back to that story, it says this, In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of money changed and overturned their tables. So you look at Jesus here in this moment and he's flipping tables. He's scattering things because there's a bunch of stuff going on in his house that shouldn't be there. And if you sit there and you objectively look at it and you say, well, these men, they were in church. These men came to church. It was a good place to be. The principle of where they physically are was super, super good. It was great for people to come to the temple. 
But where they were physically, they were not mentally. They were physically in the house of God. They were physically in a place of worship, but mentally they were not there. And here's the question I ask you, because I find I can be guilty of this as I just shared. When you're physically in moments with God, where are you mentally? Because sometimes I feel like we can get caught up in church and we're in worship or someone's sharing a message that they believe God has placed on their heart, the word of God, someone's sharing or we're in worship and we're thinking about our job. We're thinking about issues at our job. Maybe we're thinking about issues of life. Maybe we're thinking about our kids' hockey game or baseball game or something like that that we, we have to take them to after. Maybe you're thinking about that great meal that you're gonna have at lunch. And the thing is, you're eventually gonna get to those moments and you're eventually gonna get to enjoy all those things in those moments. But the danger is when you go into a moment with God, when you go into worship God, and for some reason you can't mentally bring yourself there. And all God is saying in that moment is you, if you would be willing to just focus and acknowledge me, if you would be willing to just dive into my presence, boy, wait to see what I'm gonna do. Back during that weekend with the youth, that was one of the most powerful times that I've got to experience worshiping with youth. It was incredible, it was amazing. And if I would have brought myself out of that moment, I would have just been watching what God was doing instead of being a part of it. But I got to sit down and pray with students. I got to sit down and see God do work in students. I got to sit down and see God personally do work in me because I was willing to bring myself into that moment. And yes, it can be a hard thing to do, but I don't ever want to be someone that's in a temple selling things in the holy house of God when God's saying, you could just worship me. You could be with me. I have so much for you. What you do and how you posture yourself in the house of God matters. What you do and how you posture yourself in the house of God matters. But remember, you are a holy temple. You are where God has chosen to dwell. So in those moments where you're alone and quiet with God, I encourage you get in that moment with God because he has so much for you there. It's a divine privilege to be in God's house in corporate worship. Make a whip. Bring yourself back into these simple moments. Slow down and lean into what he has for you. Last thing I want to focus on today is this. Whip to stand out. Whip to stand out. If you study this passage of scripture and you look at it in the different gospels, that they place it in different timelines, kind of in all the gospels. But there is some scholars that believe the fact that this story actually took place just soon, like not long before Jesus went to the cross or before Jesus got arrested and ultimately tried and crucified for our sins. This moment very well could have been a defining moment where people started to notice Jesus. Because if you look at the life of Jesus, yes, he did some controversial things. Yes, he stood out. But Jesus walked into a temple with people, started flipping tables and made a whip and drove cattle out because he believed it was supposed to be a place of holiness. Place of holiness. This very well could have been a kickstart to the events that led to the crucifixion and his arrest. Mark 11, 17 to 18 says this, same story. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priest and the teacher of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for ways to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. This would lead me to believe that this was a moment that made Jesus stand out. This could very well have been a defining moment where Jesus decided to stand out as a controversial figure. And yes, it was God's plan. Yes, it was God's will that Jesus went to the cross, but he was 100% human and 100% God. And I full well believe that he was feeling emotions. And I believe it shows it all throughout scripture where Jesus felt emotions just like us. And all I think of is Jesus going up to that temple, walking in, seeing the unholiness there, seeing the things that were happening that did not honor God, that did not bring God glory, fame, did not worship God. And he looked at that and he stepped outside the temple. And this is paraphrased how I imagine it. And he started making a whip. And as he sat down there and his disciples were like, Jesus, what are you doing? What are you doing? And they didn't understand. Jesus would have been in that moment. And he full well could have been thinking, Father, be with me in this moment. His father, once I do this, once I go into that temple, once I really show them that your house is supposed to be a house of honor, your house is supposed to be a house of holiness, when I go in and do that, people are going to notice me. If they didn't notice me now, I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb now. 
God, you sure you want me to do it this way? God, you sure you want me to stand out now? God, you sure now is the time? And Jesus would have full well knew what was coming. But in that moment, I believe as the son of God, he realized the importance that the temple, which is now, like I said, we are the temple, we are the house of God, we are where his presence dwelled. The place where God's presence dwelled was supposed to be a place of holiness. And he said, if you're gonna make a statement, let's make a statement on this because this one is worth it. That followers of Jesus are supposed to be called to be holy, set apart a light to the world. He made a whip. It still blows me away. He sat down and made a whip. As a follower of Jesus, let me tell you this, and this is where we're really gonna rest on an end. As a follower of Jesus, you were called to stand out. As a follower of Christ, you will stand out. As a follower of Christ, you will stand out. This whole message was about, would you make a whip? Would you make a whip in these things in your life that aren't necessarily holy? Would you make a whip so that you could be holy? So that you could be holy inwardly? So that you wouldn't just appear holy, but you could be holy inwardly. And as a follower of Christ, you will stand out and you will stand out because of the holy way that you choose to live your life. So my question is the last thing, would you make a whip? Whip to stand out. God calls you to stand out. And if you as a follower of Jesus, you don't stand out, I'd ask yourself, is it time you make a whip and stand out? Is it time that you bring those things out of your life that shouldn't be there? Because Jesus wants you to be a light of this world. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says this, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, like, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. I love how this says, let your light shine before others. Because as followers of Jesus, we're called to be a light. People should look at us and see the way that we live, see the joy that we have, see the way that we worship God, and it should be something that's attractive to them, or at least something that allows them to ask questions and be like, what's going on there? Should I experience that? Is that for me? But sometimes people get this light idea, and I find they almost get this toxic image, where instead of like Jesus describing us like a lamp on a stand that people look at and find refuge in that light, sometimes I feel like sometimes we can be like a flashlight where we just go and we just start shining it in people's eyes, where we just wave the light and we just start calling out sin and everything like that in people's life and they don't understand what the light is meant for. And I wanna tell you and just encourage you, be mindful that when you are looking to stand out as a follower of Jesus, which is always a great thing, don't try to be a flashlight. Flashlights, ultimately, if you shine a flashlight in someone's eye, it's gonna end up hurting their vision. They're gonna end up seeing black spots. They're not gonna enjoy you shining a flashlight in their eye. But what they will enjoy is that you are willing to be a lamp. If you're willing to, like a lamp does, it lights a path up before them that they'll look at your light and they'll want to walk in your light. Because following Jesus, you are supposed to stand out. Your love for Jesus, the way that you live, is supposed to stand out. And even if people don't get it, even if people don't see it the way that you do, it should be something that people see and ask questions about. God calls us to be holy people. Your light is supposed to illuminate the way, not condemn their path. Let it shine before others, not at others. If you don't stand out as a follower of Jesus, I would say it's time to make a whip. And the whole point I'm landing on today is that we are called to be holy and set apart. We are God's people. And just as Jesus made a whip and went into that temple and he saw things there that maybe gave an appearance of holiness, that he looked at the temple and saw it appeared holy, but when he got inside and he saw things, there wasn't a lot of holiness going on there. Jesus says, I don't just want you to appear holy. I want you to be holy. Get in my word. Have a passion for my word. Follow my word. Jesus will completely revolutionize your relationship with him if you're willing to get in those moments with him and really seek his will and really seek his face. Don't allow yourself to be so distracted that you miss out on what God is doing. And ultimately, stand out for Jesus. As you stand out for Jesus, he will be with you. He will go before you. Be a light to others. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you. And hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk. And again, 
You can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.